today's topic is uh, dealing with the story behind the fossils. And I've asked a lot of questions when I introduced the, uh, when we pr promoted it, we advertised it. So I'm gonna answer those questions, but I got a lot of slides, so I gotta keep moving here. A lot of pictures, uh, we got, we're doing the whole thing, dinosaurs, we're doing the Grand Canyon, we're going all the way. So be ready for a fast ride. But we got to begin, we're going to begin with scripture. And I believe it's so important that we start with the word of God. So I'm going to read 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 2 to 7. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before my the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust and saying, where is this promise of his coming? For since the fathers fall asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will willfully forgot that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth was standing out of water and in water by which the world then existed, perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and pernition of the ungodly men. Now, these are prophetic words. This is God speaking. He tells us very clearly that because they forgot, because they forgot who God is, they kept on doing what they wanted to do. They were sinning. They walked away from God. He came in judgment. And he wiped out the whole world. And that's what it says. It says here, he wiped out, he said, by which they, the world that existed, perish, being flooded with water. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the world. That is everything. There are people that say the flood is local. The scripture does not speak of local floods. It doesn't speak of a specific spot. It speaks of the whole world. And so we understand that, yes, the earth, came by water. Do you know that every rock on earth, minerals themselves, 90% of the minerals have been made by water. All rock, sedimentary rock, is made by water. It's water-driven. So God, yes, he's telling us that he formed the earth with water, and then we had a flood, and the flood literally gave us the fossil deposits we have today. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So I want you to understand that the scoffers come scoffing and say, what, what's going on? You know, we're just going to live as we normally live. So well, I'll explain that because that's what we call uniformitarianism. That's where we talk about long periods of time. Uh, things change very, very slowly and so on. So we want to make sure that's clear. So we're reminded in Luke 17, 26, 28, Christ talked about the flood as it, if it was a real event. In Matthew 24, 37, 39, Jesus said that the world will be as evil when he comes again as it was the days of Noah. Second Peter 3, 4 to 17, which we just did, 13. It says Peter teaches that a coming judgment is for the entire heavens and earth, just as the worldwide flood was for the entire earth. I mean, that Second Peter 3, 4 to 13 nails it for me. I mean, we're going to see other verses too. In Genesis 9 to 9, 17, it said, God makes the covenant between Noah and his descendants that we will never again destroy the world with water. God will never destroy the world with water. That is a promise. And then we look at, we, as we look at the scripture, we also see some neat things. We see that the fact that the whole earth, as we look at the, the scripture, the whole earth was destroyed during the Genesis flood. Everything was destroyed. Everything was cursed. How do I know? Just read the scripture. Read chapter 6 through 9. That's where the whole flood takes place. It says the face of the earth. It says in the earth. The earth was corrupt. The earth filled with violence. Destroyed the earth. All flesh. Breath of life. All that was in that day of the, in the dry land. These expressions, all flesh cut off, destroy the flesh. All these expressions are speaking of a totality. It's not just part of the earth. It's everyone included. Water has increased greatly. The face of the waters, waters prevailed. War, uh, all the high hills, um, the waters rose to the mountains, the highest mountains. 
if you can bring if you can bring water to Mount Everest, let me ask you a question: What else is going to be left? The whole world was flooded. All, all the fountains of the great deep flood of uh, flood of waters upon the earth, the face of the whole earth. There's scripture upon scripture that tells us this is not a local event. So I want to make sure it's clear. We're talking about a catastrophe, a catastrophe that probably has never been seen before. Uh, I mean, we're not going to see a catastrophe like this before. Uh, God's got another way of ending the world. I don't want to be around because that, that's going to be pretty bad. We're going to end with fire. We're going to end with a big bang. So I want to now address the second topic, which is fossil in the rocks. The first topic was the Bible. So let's take a look at worldview. What is your worldview? Do you believe in Genesis? Do you believe in the Word of God? Then if you believe in the Word of God, you believe in six days of creation. You believe that the earth is not very old. It's probably around 6,000 years. If you believe that the earth in evolution is true, and you have to put millions of years in there, you have to believe in an old earth. And they tell us we came from a big bang. They teach the kids in school that we came from a big bang. And we don't know how it started, but you came from a big bang. And eventually, through mis these haphazard mistakes, you came to be. We know that, that that's problematic in thinking. It's not logical. So what do we resort to? We resort to God, who is a creator of the universe. That's what we resort to. We resort to the fact that he's the Logos. He controls everything. So as we look at the rocks, we'll talk about fossils. They come together. The rocks... The rock fossils are found in the rocks. So what is uniformitarianism? Well, uniformitarianism is the fact that these layers are formed gradually, one at a time of long periods of time. They're formed gradually, one at a time, and they, they just build up layer after layer, and supposedly they take long periods of time. They, they think that, okay, we got this layer here, and we're going to wait another thousand years we're going to get another layer thousand, before you know we got a millions of years and that's what they think now we don't believe that why because we believe that in what we call catastrophism catastrophe says that layers lay down one right after another after a short time as a result of catastrophe now i will give you a witness i went to the grand canyon i have some pictures of the grand canyon to show you and when you look at the Grand Canyon, you will see layer after layer. And it's not like segmented. It's not, you know, separated by large gaps. No, it's layer on top of layer. That's like a layer cake. And when you lay a cake down, you put one pad, one layer at a time. And it, it, it has to come instantly. It doesn't come like, it comes in with a year. It doesn't take millions of years. That's called catastrophism. We believe that the layers came down and they came down because of a catastrophe, which we call the worldwide flood. Now, most geologists will agree that many of the large rock layers are deposited in water-related conditions. Uh, you listen, I teach earth science at Florida, uh, Florida Bible College, and I enjoy it because this is one thing we understand. We, we're gonna talk about sedimentary rocks, and we see rocks that are made of sediments, sedimentary rocks, are rocks that we find the fossils in. They're sediments, aren't they? But these sedimentary rocks are water-driven. So we see that rocks and fossils come together. Further to deposit the fossil record, we would need to kill millions of animals and quickly deposit them in wet sediments. Is there a biblical explanation for this? Yes, there is. It comes down to the one that's very obvious, a worldwide flood. Now we look at, uh, there are a vast blanket of sedimentary rock layers that stretch out over North America, almost every continent. It contains marine fossils, which indicate the oceans were over the continents at one time. I hope you understand that. In Florida, if you, we have a lot of marine fossils. Well, we're next to the ocean. And where I'm sitting right now, we're probably underneath the ocean. <laughs> we rose up probably after the ice age. But I'm not talking about millions of years. I'm talking within thousands of years. We believe the flood took place about 2,500 uh, 2, years. I, I can give you the exact date, but let's just stay within a, a round figure. And, and at that particular point, we have about 4,000 years in that time frame. 
where we, we've, we've existed. So we kind of keep that in mind. Now, these, these were rapidly deposited. So we look at the, the sediment layers, and you can see a picture over here. You see them right here. The, the layers, see the layers there? They lay down. Now, the deep sandstone and red wall limestone of the Grand Canyon can be traced across the entire. Uh, let me get this squared. I'm not talking about the Grand Canyon. I'm going to come to this. This is a very important point tonight's lesson. Um, I want people to understand that the red limestone and uh, from the Grand Canyon, okay, and the Tapete sandstones don't just end there. They continue through the United States to Canada, into the Atlantic Ocean, to England. Do you know how big this is? In other words, the rocks that touch the basic rock. What's the basic rock? It's foundational rock. We believe that's the creation rock. These rocks, Tapete and Tapete sandstone and red wall limestone, are what we call sedimentary rock. That's what we call water-driven sediments. So these sedimentary rocks extend all the way out. And that's a key point. I want you to understand that it's very big, very large. And we see this all over the world, not just this part, but all over the world. The standard way uh, is known as the uniformitarian way. The uniformitarian is geologist looks at the current rates and calculates backwards to find out the age. Now, understand that when we talk about age, if we talk about rate that takes long periods of time, remember we talked about Second Peter, the idea of scoffers will come scoffing. Well, that's what we're talking, long periods of time, little bit by little bit. For example, one layer accumulates per year and there are a million of layers we might assume that took a million years for the whole sequence to form. So that's what they're talking about. If you went to geology school, you went to, not my earth science, but you went to an earth science class in many universities, that's what they're going to tell you. Charles Lyell popularized this idea of uniformitarianism, deep time. You know, he said that the present is key to the past. Slow change, very slow, slow, slow over millions of years. We, that's how he believed things happen. And he went against the church, the church teachings, and his theory uh, was applied directly to Darwin's theory of evolution. They were very close friends, Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin. So when geologists go out and work, they're going to be looking at rock layers, uh, as catastrophists, um, geologists say that most of the geological record was not deposited slowly and gradually, but it results from a catastrophic events. That large amount of geological work was done in a short period of time. Now, I need to tell you that is true. Today, uniformitarianism is falling backwards because people are saying, hey, that we got a what, national, uh, the dinosaur national monument. All of a sudden, these dinosaurs are washed together. How did that happen? It came from a flood. So now you hear them say flood. They, they say local floods and so on. Geologists in recent years have given straight uniformitarianism. They are now adapt rather catastrophic um, view and call themselves neo-catastrophists. So now we see that they're coming to our site, but they still hold on to evolution and they hold on to the millions of years. The horizontal bedding layer is almost every locality is interpreted as catastrophic deposit being laid down in a very short period of time. Each of these layers, however, thought to result from different catastrophes separated by millions of years. What are we talking about? Take a look at this. This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, see how these layers are laid? You see them? How they're, and so supposedly they're laid and they're, now they say, uh, the neocatastrophe says, well, this is laid, and this one was like right after that. It happened quickly, but it took millions of years to get from here to here. So they kind of have their own way of interpreting it. We look at it and say, you know what? That came because of a quick flood. One sediment laid down as it hardened, and another sediment came and laid down. Another one came and laid down. And it didn't come like we had, uh, there was 365 plus days when flood, 40 days. 40 nights had a lot of the flood waters, but then it started to settle. So we had time, not millions of years. I'm talking within a year, we had time for this to settle down and to move. So uh, we're going to take a look at rapid erosion. Take a look at the Grand Canyon. 
I'm going to show you a picture uh, of us in the Grand Canyon, my wife and I, and share with you some of our experiences. But right here, you're going to see, see the, see the, see the Grand Canyon. Do you see these things over here? Take their lines. Take a look. You see the lines? Now think about that. Those are knife edge boundaries between rock layers. If it took millions of years, what would happen? You have plants grow and they would de deposit uh, soil and then it will turn it into rock. It's never going to be smooth. It can't be smooth. It had to be deposited by a catastrophe. So that's what it's telling us, that it, rock lays in a kick, continuous deposition. By deposition, they mean putting down. That's a, a geological term. They drop dirt or drop layer after layer with no time or erosion taking place. It just happened in that period of time during the flood. Now, we find fossil seashells up in the air. I found a fossil seashell and the amount uh, uh, where we were doing, we were digging up dinosaur bones at Grand Canyon. It's located 7,000 7, feet up or 5,000 feet up. And I found a shell. And immediately the lady said, you know how that shell came to be? I said, how? She said, well, the ocean just went up and down. I said, how about Noah's flood? That would make sense. Said, no, no, we don't accept that. <laughs> a shell, come on, 7,000 feet up in the air. You're going to find a beach there? So that should tell you something. Something catastrophic must have happened. And we find shells 7,000 feet up in the air. I got news for you. We can still do it. So what does a fossil record look like? You guessed marine shells. But what they've done is they neatly put this thing together, piled upon pile, they put the fossils and they put it together and they kind of arranged it so that the, the ones, the heavier ones would fall to the bottom and they said, okay, this, this one will start us off and then we'll go all the way up and we'll put it this way. Now this is pretty solid and creationists believe that this, Marine fossils are a, a good way to go. Why? Because there's plenty of them. Why are there plenty of them? Well, here's what the fossil record tells us. It tells, tells us that 95% of the fossil record is made of what? Marine invertebrates, shellfish. The other 4.74% is algae and plant fossils. Ladies and gentlemen, do you see what we have right now in the fossil record? We don't have anybody, we don't have any dinosaurs. Do you see any dinosaurs? Do you see any footprints? No. So it tells you 0.235% insects and vertebrates. We move on, we say that 0.125% of fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And we go on and we see that only 1% of 0.125% represents a single bone. Almost everyone coming from the Ice Age. Isn't that amazing? So what does the Grand Canyon look like? That's my lovely wife, Linda. And I took a picture when we're, this is about 15 years ago, I'm aging ourselves there. But you can see the river, you see the river? I don't know if you've ever been down to Grand Canyon, but that's what the river looks like. It's muddy, there's a lot of erosion. But right over here, above here, you're gonna see rock layer after rock layer. It's, it's really neat to see that. So you can see the rock layers upon rock layers, and, right, and the river is about a mile down, a mile down. So, I mean, it was a great experience. We enjoyed every bit of it. We actually saw the layers. I saw layers actually make Zs, a Z like this. How could that happen over a long period of time? A Z means that you probably had some settling and it had to happen quickly. Now, you look at the mountains, you can see like there's lines, like somebody drew a line, you see? See those lines? It's like somebody drew lines, okay? You go up there, you can see lines, lines. Now, nobody came here with a, with a, uh, with, you know, big shovels and, you know, digging. That formed naturally. You follow me? That's natural. Um, some people believe that maybe a dike broke and the water just came right through. That's possibility. But what we see here, is we see layer after layer. That Grand Canyon gives us so much to see. Take a look at the fossils. You see the shells, the different kind. That's the trilobite. Um, here's a little shell on the side. Um, and you get to see some, lots of, we see insects a lot of way. We see a lot of insects. You can see them everywhere. Here's a Grand Canyon nautiloid. The nautiloids are extinct squid marine creatures. 
Okay, you see a picture over here? That's what they look like. They left their remains behind. Where did they leave them behind? On the lower part of the canyon. It's called the red uh, red clay. The, here, here. So we call it Nautilite Canyon because we find a lot of these Nautilites, these fossils. Millions of straight shell chambered Nautilites are found fossilized with other marine vertebrate creatures in a seven foot thick layer of red wall limestone. Now, red means the iron. Limestone is what we, what we, in Florida, you, that's what I'm walking on, limestone. So limestone is really a deposit of corals and things like that. Red wall means that iron entered into it. So we got a beautiful red color, but it's like the rocks that are made of South Florida. Okay, so get an idea, that's what we're talking about. The fossil graveyard stretches 180 miles across North Arizona into South Nevada, covering an area at least 10,500 square miles. That's a lot of mileage. And when you look at it, you're gonna see fossils after fossils. These squid-like fossils are all different sizes from small, young, nautilites to bigger and older relatives. Here's another picture of one. Okay, you see it over here. And then over here, you actually see the fossil. There's the foot, there's a fossil. So if you went on the Grand Canyon, at that red limestone, you could actually, in, in that area, you could actually find them. Where do you find fossils? You find fossils where they're exposed. That could be because of erosion. That could be because of several factors. But usually when you find them, it's like a graveyard. It doesn't stop. And that's what, that's what we found here in the Grand Canyon and the Lloyd Formation. Now, this is a beautiful picture. I like this one. This is an artistic rendition of what a northern light might look like. They're right over here. They're extinct. Okay, so we don't know what they really look like. We got an idea. That's an artist in interpretation, but that's them really layered in the, in the ground. Okay, so as we move forward, we see that the long, slender shelves of numerous nautilites, the Nautilite Canyon, have dominant orientation, indicating that the current was operating as a fine grain lime mud accumulated. What does that mean? It means that they were moved and they were moved in a certain way, a certain direction. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Steve Austin, who made this quote, did the study. He found that these nautilites with a PhD in geology from Penn State, Dr. Austin points out as true of many of the world's mass, mass fossil graveyards. How many graveyards do we have? Thousands worldwide, thousands. I'm gonna show you two today graveyards, that the enormous nodalite deposition provides the indisputable proof of rapid formation of the significant layer of the canyon. So you get an idea that when we look at these things, we can see very clearly that there was rapid deposition. That means there was a worldwide flood. How did they get there? By water. And water just put them there. It moved it. it you think of the flood waters not as a bathtub, you know, it's just, no, the water, there was movement of water going back and forth. And so you had this turbulence going on and it was laying the fossils as we saw them. Now, there's one other thing I need to talk to you about, and that's called the Cambrian explosion. It deals with the Grand Canyon in some way, and I'm going to tie it so you can understand it. So let's talk about the young earth for a second. How do we get 6,000 years? Well, Martin Luther from Germany and Calvin uh, from France both maintain a young earth model is described in Genesis. They believed in literal days. As we look at, uh, by the way, Calvin said a space of six days, and people just exaggerated what he was talking about. When you read the writings about Calvin and what he meant by days, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it, there were millions of years in that space of six days. It was actually six days. Well, the Annals of the World, written by Usher, James Usher, Anglican Archbishop, was very thorough. And he did a very thorough job in coming up with 6,000 years. So where did we get to 6,000 years from? Well, a lot of the work was done by James Usher. Usher. You can check it. There are Bible scholars in South Florida Bible College that went through the script. They said they got 6,000, maybe it's 7,000. But ladies and gentlemen, Six to seven thousand dollars years is not millions of years. It's not even hundreds of thousands of years. So if somebody says to me it's ten thousand years, I don't. I, that's called young Earth. Period. So we can have a little discrepancy, but it's not, to me it, the Earth is young. Period. 
There's probably no name more indelibly linked with the rigid church fundamentalism than that of Bishop Usher, uh, which today is almost exclusively known as the man who fixed the time of creation at midday at October 23rd, 4004 BC. Now, that is Stephen J. Gould. He's passed away. He's famous for his famous punctuated equilibrium. And I'm going to explain that to you. It's a very important concept because he looked at the fossil record and came out with a different interpretation. See, he saw, when we talked about catastrophism, that's what he saw. He saw catastrophism. He saw, boom, all of a sudden we saw fossils. Oh, boom, all of a sudden we saw fossils. So he changed things around. What did he do? Well, take a look. We have this tree. You see this tree of life? All the connections. That's what Darwin believed in. See, Darwin believed in this beautiful tree of life. See that? All connecting. But look what Jay Gould did. He drew lines. Why did he draw lines? Because you see where this, these things are? See the lines? I'm, there are no, no transitional fossils. All of a sudden, there's another one. And there's another one. By transitional fossils, I mean like you go from a cat to a dog or wherever you want to go, like man to, I mean, from ape to man, there's got to be transitionals in between. As my wife said, we don't come from any monkeys because I'd be able to see something that might look like a man is a monkey. I, she hasn't seen one, even though she's married to me. <laughs> she hasn't seen one. Okay, do you see, ladies and gentlemen, that this, see what he did? And now all the books don't have trees anymore. They have lines. So what are we really looking at? We're looking at this. The fossil record reveals no transitional fossils. If these fossils are non-existent, there's no branches. So branches have disappeared from the tree. That should make you wonder. If you don't have branches, how do you have evolution? You mean you have a monkey and then all of a sudden you have a human. That's about right. The fossils we find are not very conclusive, although they like to say they are. The very few that mean anything. So now I'm going back to the Grand Canyon. You see the Grand Canyon? That's the beautiful picture. There is a million years missing where the basement rocks, which are composed of metamorphic rocks called schist and granite, touch the tape, tape uh, sandstone. So let me help you. You see, this is the upper branch over here. Do you see it right here? These are the sediment, sedimentary layers. That's where the sediment gets piled up on top of each other, pile by pile by pile. They pile up. And that's, how, that's what we saw in the Grand Canyon, these sharp lines and so on, we see them. Now, what's underneath here? That's the old rock. That's not sedimentary rock. That's metamorphic. Metamorphic means that it's old rock because it's, it's worked on, it's changed. A good example of metamorphic uh, uh, mineral, we'll, we'll look at diamond. Diamonds are metamorphic. Why? Because they've been worked on. There are once charcoal. What happened to charcoal? It went down the earth and pressure and so on. It turned to diamond. Now, it didn't take doesn't take millions of years, by the way. You just have to have the right conditions to do it. A worldwide flood certainly would have done that, pushing all that rock around and all that could cause those pressures that we we observe today in the rocks. We see these metamorphic rocks, like for instance, slate. Okay. Slate is a metamorphic rock. Granite is igneous. Granite is not. Granite comes from the volcanoes, uh, and so on. There are a lot of rocks that come from volcanoes and other rocks that have to be worked on. Those rocks that need to be worked on with pressure, like slate, and like um, in this case, the the they call it the schist uh, on the bottom, the bottom of the canyon. I'm going to take pick. They'll come back here. I'll show you now again. Take a look. Do you see the bottom line here? This is the, see this line here I'm running from? See that line? That's the very important line. There's a Tepe sandstones. Remember, it goes all the way through the United States. It goes all the way through here. And then these rocks here are the old rocks, okay? So we have a line there. Now I wanna show you something. When you look at the Grand Canyon, you look deep, right? I'm pointing right in here. I'm just going to kind of show you what's happening in the bottom right here, very, very bottom, past the borderline a little bit. Well, sometimes it's, it's exposed when you're going in the canyon. You can actually see the, the, 
the metamorphic rocks that just come up. So, so that line, that line there is the old rock and the sedimentary rock is kind of newer, it's on top, okay? New research allows answer that may lie in second geological period uh, currently. A dramatic, bound, uh, dramatic boundary known as a grand, great unconformity between two ancient igneous and metamorphic rocks uh, are layer rock and younger sediments. So what are they? So these are these are the bottom rocks, okay? Very bottom, and then the Tepeat sandstones and the other rocks, red limestone. They all come on top of that. Now, there's something missing. What's missing? Well, if you have the sedimentary rocks standing, putting on top of the sedimentary rocks right here, see them? Sedimentary rocks. There they are. Make the Grand Canyon, and then the bottom is the is the Tepeat limestone. I mean, is the um, schist and all that, it's a basement rock. That basement rock is dated at a much older rate than this rock up here. Actually, what they found out that there is a billion, not million, a billion years missing. Do you hear what I'm saying? A billion years missing. What happened to it? They can't find it. The billion years the sedimentary rock had been laid down is much younger. The rock that's on bottom is dated much older, according to evolutionary theory. So they got a problem. You follow? What happened to a billion years? That's a lot of years of evolutionary time. <laughs> the Earth is 4.6 billion years, they say. That billion years, that's a lot of time missing. So there's a problem. And that's what they're trying to tell us right now. This is recent. Now, there's, there's the, the fossils of the Depeat limestone, okay? That's what we call Cambrian, as a Cambrian fossil. When we, uh, when we piece them, that together, we realize that its formation must have had profound implication for the ocean chemistry at the time when complex life was just proliferating. Now, this is just a scientist trying to figure out the big problem. Not only, are you listening? Not only is there a billion years missing of the rock layers, something fantastic happens here. Unbelievable. And evolutionists have another big problem. The first problem is they can't find the billion years, okay, of rocks. It's gone. They can't find it. According to their theory, they're missing it. And, and remind, I remind you now, it goes long through the United States, not just Grand Canyon, it continues all the way around. It's big. Now, what we find out is that as we look at this, something happened. What happened? We got life. All of a sudden, at the bottom of the canyon, we have ocean life. Remember ocean life? Fossils. Fossils everywhere. There's fossils that are floating around here that somebody drew them. Yes, but we have the boat. We have the, we actually have, we, we dug them up. We actually have the structure of what they could have looked like. So we fleshed them out a little bit. It's to show you that there are many, many new creatures that all of a sudden existed. It came to be. All of a sudden, these beautiful, beautiful creatures like insects of the sea came to be. How did that happen? We lost a billion years, right? All of a sudden now we had a Cambrian explosion at the same time. So a billion years in the rock layers are laid down. What creations say is that this is a sign of the creatures crawling on the bottom, the trilobites and all those other creatures crawling on the bottom. They live there. As a result, um, we had a worldwide flood and they washed down. That was the first ones to wash down, the ones we saw. But the evolutionists can't understand it. It's light. If they believe that we came from simple things like a jellyfish, and all of a sudden you get a big bang, and that big bang is a bang that really speaks of uh, a creation. <laughs> Take a look at that. All of a sudden, boom, there's life. That's a big bang. All of a sudden, we have a Cambrian explosion with all those different organ organisms. Now we'll go back to Stephen Jay Gould. That's why he changed this whole story. He gave up those branches because of that. This is what he says. 
the extreme rarity of transitional form in the fossil record persists as a trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have date data only at the tips of the and the nodes of the branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. So what do we have? Take a look at our tree, ladies and gentlemen. You see our tree? That's creation. That's creation. That affirms that the locust, the God creator, made us. There's no way you could get around that. So Stephen Jay Gould called it punctuated equilibrium with Niles Eldridge. They both came together and made this theory up that all of a sudden, boom, fossils came to right conditions and all of a sudden life came to be. It's crazy. How could that ever happen? So how about dinosaurs? How do they fit in? Well, we'll talk a little bit about them. This is the uh, Dinosaur National Monument. I visited there some time ago. Um, 1909, Dr. Earl Douglas and his team discovered thousands of dinosaur fossils. There's over 1,500 dinosaur bones exposed right there. Um, on the site, there are 11 different kinds of dinosaurs, including uh, Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, Ap Ap Apatosaurus, which is very big, Camosaurus, big dinosaur, Diplodocus, very big. So we had these big sauropods, those are big dinosaurs, also mixed with the batch. So ladies and gentlemen, how did it get there? How did those fossils, those dinosaurs, the 1,500 dinosaur bones, how did they get there? Does anybody know? A flood. And that's not me talking. That was the docent at the museum when I was there at the monument. She told me, I said, how did all those dinosaurs get jumbled up? She said it was a flood. Just like when I was on top of the mountain, 7,000 feet. <laughs> you know what this proves? This tells me that we had a worldwide flood to take those great big dinosaurs and move them about. I mean, seriously, that's what we're talking about, big dinosaurs moving about to make that kind of arrangement. So as we look at that, we can see this. Um, this is the American Museum of Natural History. Along with this is is uh, this was found in Ghost Ranch, New Mexico in 1947. Dozens of skeletons were discovered. Now, these are graveyards. These are graveyards. Why? Because we found, uh, we found dozens of these things. Dozens of skeletons were found similar to this. This is Coelophysis. It's a, this is a, from our museum. It, you can see it right in the back wall there. It's light built. It's got long back legs. You can see the back legs, grasping hands. You see it? Sharp teeth in its mouth. Uh, stomach contents are found inside. Now, wait a minute. You hear what I just said? Stomach contents are found inside. How do you find stomach contents inside? Well, the thing didn't die slowly. That's the bottom line. He suffocated. He was washed away. That is a scene of an animal being washed away. Uh, I'm going to show you something else. I took a little picture since it was at our, our museum. I was able to do this. So uh, let's see what I, I'm, I'm moving in close. You see it? I'm showing you the insides. You can see the insides of the belly. They said he was cannibalistic. I don't know if he was eating his own kind, but he certainly had something in there. That shows you that that dinosaur basically uh, was rapidly buried quickly. Another thing. I want to show you is that, oops, let me go back too fast. Um, yeah, it's not going in. Okay. We had Archaeopteryx before. Let's see if I get one more shot of this. No, it didn't go. Okay, I had Archaeopteryx there. Um, let me get back again so you can see it again. Uh, see that bent neck? That bent neck tells us that he suffocated. And I have Archaeopteryx fossil just like that. For some reason, it's not coming in. But he has a bent neck too, just like that. And we find many fossils that, that have bent necks like that seem to be having a hard time breathing. As a result, they died. And we believe it was sophistication uh, because of death of suffocation. That's what we believe. 
Now take a look at these dinosaur footprints since they've been on. We'll talk a little bit about dinosaur footprints. These are dilophice forces. We we have dilophorces right here in our museum. It's a thoroughbred pod because there's three three um, you know there's three um, toes. Now T. Rex has the same thing. Guess what they found on the site uh, just recently at Glen Rose, Glen, Ro Glen Rose, Texas. They found they found three just like this, and but they said it couldn't be T. Rex. It had to be a dinosaur before that because they dated the rocks 100 million years. Now I'm putting lines on you. You might say, "Why are you putting lines on?" Because I'm going to show you something. See, we found the dinosaur footprints from a dinosaur. Let's say it was a, um, a uh, let's say it was a sauropod, big one. And then we found that right there. And then we found the same footprint, another layer. Now this layer was dated very old. This layer was dated younger. And then we found the same footprint on another layer. Now, how did this footprint get from here to here to here on two, la three layers? How did it do it? Did it, so here's, here's what we think. This is the theory. And so um, we believe the tracks of sauropods, theropods, that was three, the three uh, toe dinosaur is a theropod. Uh, adult billed dinosaurs have been discovered. These dinosaurs possibly can swim. Their exact, uh, their exact same footprints are found in higher rock layers. So we got this little guy here, this Hatterosaurus swimming while the Stegosaurus and Triceratops are sinking. Just a theory. So we believe that that one kind of dinosaur was able to go up, and the only we the only way we can explain it that like dogs dog uh, dogs do a dog paddle these these animals could do the same and possibly were moving from layer to layer. Now notice this, you notice how straight these foot, footprints are. See that, ladies and gentlemen, I checked those footprints from Biloxi. They follow the same pattern. What's the pattern? They go straight. Now we have found animal footprints all over the place. You find animal footprints, you can see them in the sand, you can see them in the snow, you can see them in the dirt if you're a good hunter. You'll find that they don't necessarily go straight. We have finding every time we find millions of dinosaur footprints, they're going straight. What does that mean? They were going somewhere and we don't know where, but they were going somewhere. They had a purpose. Maybe they thought that there was something behind them that they had to get, get away from. That's what we see with these footprints. They had a purpose. They were going in one direction, one direction only. Even when there were sets of them, they're moving the same. Sauropods, by the way, big dinosaurs can swim, we believe. They had light bones, they could swim. So the water would pick them up, they move to the next layer. And look, they, we found these dinosaur tracks, not only straight, they are on flat bedding planes. In other words, they weren't walking on mountains. We find them straight. Now, how do you make a footprint like that? Well, they walk and they leave that footprint on sand. It's got to get covered up. It's got to be, uh, there's got to be heat formation and covered up right away, else it's going to lose. How, why is it going to lose the footprint? Because wind, after years, wind, whatever water will wear that footprint away. Think about it. Footprints don't last in sand. Why? Because it's wind, water, whatever it is. Why do these footprints stay? Because that's showing you that something happened, something different happened. So don't let these, these dinosaur footprints throw you. <laughs> that shows you there was a worldwide flood. Now we dig dinosaurs. We, we, we had people that love to dig with us. Uh, we haven't done it for a while because we, we haven't had the interest, but we brought people up to Montana in Glendive and we dug dinosaurs. I'm on top of a dinosaur right here, Triceratops. I did break a little bone. I was using a screwdriver, went in too far. You got to be kind of not nice with that. But take a look at this. That's Scott McCohen, Dr. McCohen's hand. Right over there is a fossil. Now, if you're digging dinosaurs with us, you'll be using a screwdriver, okay? You'll be brushing with a brush. And that's what Dr. McCohen did. And then when we came up to this layer, he started to move very gently around it because you know what he found? Well, it looked like a bone or something. That's what he found. What is that? That's a T-Rex tooth, a tip of T-Rex tooth. I show that to everybody because like we, after the first hour we were there, uh, he found it. 
it sometimes takes days to find something like that. But this is a T-Rex tooth. And we thought we might find some more, but we didn't, which is a loose T-Rex tooth in the sand. There he is with Otis Klein. That's Dr. McCohen. Um, he's, there he was. He's a veterinarian, retired veterinarian. There it is. You see the T-Rex the tooth right there? Otis Klein is the owner of the property, and I worked with him for many years with these dino digs. There it is up close. Now, there's serrations on this tooth. Dinosaur teeth had serrations like shark's teeth do. So that's a way of identifying them. You can see them. Now, what's interesting is that right next to that tooth, and I was there to tell you this, there was a turtle scoop. Almost looked just like this. That turtle scoop is from a modern turtle scoop. So how can you have a modern day turtle scoop, a scoop is part of a shell, turtle shell, with a 65 million T-Rex tooth? There's a problem there. You follow me? <laughs> you got a problem. How can you find a 65 million year old tooth with a, with a, with a modern day turtle scoop? That's a problem. So, uh, I, I began to examine it to see the bottom of the tooth is right here, the T Rex tooth. This is an actual, uh, um, it's a casting, but it does a good job representing the mouth. And uh, we have one of these in our museum. And you could see right in here, you could see the teeth and so on. You can see how big they are. Uh, and they found the bottom of that tooth. Now, th to show you, see the serrations in the teeth? That's serrations. They have 50 serrations per tooth. And the larger tooth can measure a foot. So they have really big, big teeth. With the, we have to go to the root and all that. We haven't found any because they break off. We think that they break off when they're killing their prey. They break their teeth off. And that's what we're finding. So when we were there, Creation Research Society came by and they wanted to date some fossils with radiometric dates. So Otis Klein, the owner of the property, and Joe Taylor, who's great excavator and knows a lot about dinosaurs. Uh, and I was there in the middle. We're in Montana. This is the middle of July. So get a picture. In the morning, you are cold. <laughs> uh, it, it then gets hot. You get up to 107 degrees. But the wind is blowing and it's dry. Totally different. Totally different. You can get real sick there because you're not sweating. If you're used to sweating, you don't sweat there. <laughs> it's kind of really dry heat. Now, over there, they cut these off and they dated it inside. How did they date? They carbon dated it. They carbon dated by using carbon and going inside. They wanted to see what the dates were, what, what they call radiometric dating. So they went ahead and dated it. And you know what year it turned out to be? Not 65 million years old like it was supposed to be. It dated out thousands of years. Understand me? Thousands of years. Not 65 million years. Now, that's a first-hand experience. Found modern-day fossils with fossils. I have dates now that say that they're young. Take a look at this. Now uh, you'll see collagen. This is 1916, Hill Creek, same formation that we were digging in. See the collagen over there? That's collagen in a T-Rex in a T-Rex bone. Professor Mark Armridge discovered the bone fragments of T-Rex collagen filaments intact. Collagen is a protein. It's intact right there. So it couldn't be 65 million years ago. A new finding in 2005 in science. They reported that they found red blood cells, soft tissue, remnants of red blood cells, soft tissue, and vessels. You squeeze the vessels and stuff would come out. The, that was from a T-Rex bone, a thigh bone that was found in Hell Creek Formation where we dug in Montana, same formation. Okay, so how did that get there? How did something like that, you take the tissue under the microscope and you, and you, you move it, it bounces back, have flexibility. It, it was unbelievable. Elasticity was able to move back. So, um, I mean, how could that happen? This is what the discoverer, uh, Mary, uh, Dr. Mary Hybe Schweider said in North Carolina State and University of Montana. This fossilized bone in the sense that it is from an extinct animal, but it doesn't have a lot of characteristics of what people would call a fossil. Do you understand this? Guess what we've been finding? 
using the same techniques, we have found that these bones basically have the same thing. We, we have found many bones that we can get into, see the red blood cells, the soft tissue, and the vessels. It's, it's amazing what's been found with them. So we see this. This is another example, preserved soft tissue, including possible blood vessels in the red blood. This, is, uh, this was aired on April 24, 2007 on PBC. I actually have the recording. It was unbelievable. So we now have live, I mean, we have tissue. I can't say that it's very old. We have red blood, lab, 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 excuse me, lab, red blood cells. We have, we even found the osteocytes, the cells, the bone cells inside there. So normally they would, they would decompose. And well, what's happening here? Evolutionists believe that there's some way they're staying there. There's some magic way they're not decomposing. There was, you know, they've been isolated. So, but we know that these couldn't be that old. They couldn't be 65 million years old to be able to do what they're doing. So now I'm going to talk. We're going to finish up with these two graveyards. It'll take me about 10 minutes. We'll try to get this done. So what's the story behind fossils, fossil graveyard, Green River formation? This is a fossil of a, a fish. It's very detailed. You can go in, you can see scales, you can see the bones, you can see all sorts of stuff. The rock that it's found in is really not, it's kind of a um, shale kind of formation. Um, you can rub it, it, it's pretty easy. It works real nice. Uh, they believe that catastrophically, the fish got buried instantaneously. That's what preserved them. And so we have thousands, thousands of fish buried at this gravesite. Where's the gravesite? It's in America. It is the Green River Formation comprises several basins form part of the uplifting of the Rocky, Rocky Mountains. Uh, these outcrops that occur are in Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah. And I, there's a map here so you can see them. See the outcrops? That's where we find the fossils. Uh, the, the fauna and, and the floral assembled fossils exhibiting remarkable preservation. So we see this, this is unbelievable testimony of fossils and all kinds of fossils. You can see, you can see the past really well there. So you can see that nicely. Here's a rapid burial. See the fish? Boom. See, and I've got, look, look, look how nicely they preserve. It has to be rapid burial of animals and plants. We see this all the time. Take a look at this one. This is a fish eating a fish. That had to be rapid burial. How could you take millions of years to do that? That happened just like that, quickly, buried. And then what, what we know is that the fossil itself, the fossil itself right in here, you can see the bones, you see the little bones. Well, they actually turn. The bones themselves turn, that, it's not bone, that's, that's crystal. Um, some of these become carbon. The carbon inside turns to a crystallized carbon and carbon is in there. So we see this, we see this continually. Here, take a look at this. These are little minnows that died catastrophically. Here's the bird. Bird was flying, got caught up, boom, buried. This is a great formation, beautifully done. We go over here and we see uh, another kind of fish. Now the fossil lake was the smallest and short lived, but the deepest lake existed in the subtropical environment flush with all sorts of animal life from its insects to mammals. Now, I found this written. I'm, I'm just quoting what they've been saying all along. These are the people that have been dealing with these fossils from the Green River. And they believe there was a deep lake there, sub, subtropical. It was very warm, they say. We know it was warm because we know that the fossils around us during Dover's flood, we had lots of fossils represent warm, that temperatures were much warmer than they are today. More than 20 species of fish populated the waters while crocodiles, turtles, and other reptiles basked along on the, the lake shores uh, lined with lush forests of palm trees and fig trees and birds and bats flew through the sky. So this is a great formation. You can find some beautiful fish. Here's another fish eating fish. This is part of our museum. There's the fish interaction. I'm not sure if this one is eating that one. This came from this block here. This is from our museum. That's an actual fossil. And you look inside, you can see that there's something going on there. Uh, and that's what we see, activity all the time in that fossil bed, plenty of activity. Now, I'm showing you a broken fossil. We broke this fossil. I, my heart went out when the fossil broke. 
It's broken into several pieces. But I wanted to do something. So I put it together kind of not so good. You can see it. It's not, I took a picture up close. You can see the crevices. I could do a much better job. But I wanted to do one thing. I wanted to show you what happens to this fish, okay, when it's buried, okay? Now, remember, there's a topping on this. There's a topping on the cake. There was rocks that was over here, and that buried that fish, okay? Let's go and take a look, and I'm going to show you the side. You see the side? See that? That's called laminations. See the laminations? Those laminations are things of settled down over the fish, okay? And now evolutionists say that those said mean that that took millions of years for that fish to be buried. Each, each layer represents lots of time. So millions of years, there's a fish laid down on the bottom of the ocean and millions of layers, okay, have, have been laid down while that fish was dead. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you seen a dead fish? I have. How about this? That's a dead fish. When fish die, they float. They get decomposed very easily. And the bottom, they'll get ripped up like shreds. There's nothing, I mean, how can a fish be so, so, uh, so exposed, but yet have so much detail in the fossil record? There's something, there's something not right. So you ready for this? This is what the evolutionists concocted. This is what they think. I'm going to I'm going to share what they thought. Here we go. The preservation of the fish implies that the climate did indeed vary at some point during the Eocene. So we know the Eocene was way back in time. It's when we supposedly had um, these fish that were living in that terrain. Now this is the grand grand days hypothesis. And I've seen a lot of positives, but this one is similar to the ones that are going around today. The lakes were characterized by a comp complicated history in which the shapes and volumes of the lakes were changed due to tectonics, sedimentary deposition, and changes in both the drainage and climate. In other words, the tonic movements, the drainage, climate changes made those fossils the way they were. Now, did they know this? How did they prove this? How did they come to that assumption? They don't know. Do you understand me? It's just a theory, but they gotta get past that idea when a fossil like this is laid down and laid down with these layers, that means millions of years, it's contrary to what they believe. How could you have all these thousands of years of a dead fish here all together in one piece? Let's go back. Secondly, the depth of the lake must have had been great allowed for a little oxygen at the greatest depth. The world, uh, this would prevent scavengers from surviving the anoxic conditions and disturbing the, the fish. Ladies and gentlemen, all this is guesswork. There's no way you could measure that. They don't never measured any oxygen on the bottom of the lake. They don't even know if the lake was deep. We know this is a fossil graveyard. And we have some reasons why those fish are the way they are. They were collected in one spot, and those that's because of the flood. I'm going to give you the last one is the Rappe graveyard in Brazil. Take a look at this. This is Brazil, and we have these fossils. That's why I'm going to show share, share you. So right here is Brazil, and in Brazil is the Rappe Basin. This is the Rappe Basin in here. This is where you find a lot of fossils, very similar to red, the uh, Green River Formation fossils. Now, this is what we have. I actually have fossils just like this in the museum. They measure, what, close to 12 inches. They make fish sandwiches. You close them up and they make a fish sandwich. Now, what's interesting about this is that this fish is called Therarius, found in the Santana Formation near the town of San, Santona, Santa Docari, not far from Sao Paulo. This fish is an extinct genus of prehistoric bony fish that lived during the abation state of the early Cretaceous epoch. So we're talking about, right, there was the Jurassic, that was million, 150 million years. So we're talking around 65 million years. Or, anyway, that's what they're talking about. 
And they, the reason why they come up with these dates is because they look at other fossils. They can't date the rocks, but they can date the, they can look at the fossils and make comparisons. And that's how they do it. So this, the Ares, is fossil that we have. We have we have several different copies. So they did from 92 to 110 million years. We don't really believe that. Here's the basin. See the basin? It's nicely exposed. They believe the tectonic movement actually moved the continents and separated them, causing a hole. And what happened with that hole? During the flood time, it collected a lot of stuff. This is amazing. This crab brisoa larvae have been found and fossilized in the stomach contents of the terrorists. So this little thing is a crab, okay? Larvae of a crab was found in that fish. <laughs> How could you find something so small in a fish? It was fossilized, it was in there. We were able to determine that because of the way the fossil lay. Now take a look at this picture. I kind of made it simple because when we're talking about the, you see how this little thing edge comes up? See the hole? This is where we think we get a lot of graveyards. You get a little hole or indentation, the water then deposits all these fossils. Take a look at these fossils right here. Where um, a missionary donated these fossils to us and you can see them. All these are fish sandwiches, beautiful done. You can actually see them. I'm going to show you how this looks. Now I'm going to, there's a, there's a, I move my camera on this and watch when you move in, you're going to see the carbon, see the black carbon come, I'm coming back. Sorry about the shaky hand, but now you can see the black, see the black carbon. That's the bones, some of the bones, but you can see almost everything in detail. It's so neat, it's so neat to see. And that's the fish. And you can see there's so many fish, thousands, millions of these fish in that area. You get an idea. So we see this too. We see that uh, these fish um, make fish sandwiches. So um, I want you to see how they make fish sandwiches. Here we go. Put it together. There you go. You have a fish sandwich. <laughs> Somebody said, how did they find these? I don't know. They, they, they know how to hunt fossils and they're able to find them very well. See that? That's a fish sandwich. So you get an idea how, how that was done. So what kind of fossils? This is just like the Green River Formation. Insects, also dragonfly, beetle, fossil, uh, fossil flying fit, uh, insect. Ladies and gentlemen, I come to tell you, and this is amazing. Evolutionists can't, this is a problem with evolution because they can't answer the question. The insects never changed over the millions of years. The same insect we're seeing in the fossil layers in a rapé, in Green River, are all the same. So they've never changed. They're still the same insects. Yeah, the cockroach and all that, they're all the same, they haven't changed. <laughs> so evolutionary work, work, doesn't work uh, doesn't work very well. Okay, now this is a beautiful fossil from, we got this from Columbia, and this is a, a cephalopoda. It's from the group defined as um, coleites. And these coleites um, have different things. They have squids and octopuses and cuttlefish. Uh, the nautiloid is something that is extinct. Uh, some of these things that I see, fossils, I, I can see natural nautiluses today that float around. So here's what, so you see the casting right over there, this is the casting. So what does this thing look like? Well, that's what it looks like. You see it? Now it's a drawing. But you kind of get the idea that there's a head, this thing moves out. This is all flesh. It's not, there's, not, there's no um, ketin or, or shell material. So here, take a look at this. This is the fossil. And watch how perfectly it fits in. With, see the casting? That's a casting. So watch how, what, what happens when we put it with the casting. See how nice that works in? It's beautifully found, beautifully done. That's why I love fossils. They're just beautiful pieces, but they tell us about the past, don't they? And as we conclude, I want to end up with a couple of verses, and I want just to think about it. The first verse I'd like to talk about is the fact that we know that the earth is young. Why? Because God spent time in the scripture to tell us about that. The first day, the first chapter in Genesis, it says God spoke. He said it. Ten times God said, God said, and he can create things in days, first day, second day, third day. And he said it was good, it was good. He said seven times, it was good, it was good, it was good. And God said ten times. 
So creation account is in God's word. And he told us that in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them. He rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy, Exodus 20, 11. Why did God create things in six days? He created things in six days so that we could keep the Sabbath. He wanted to demonstrate to us very clearly that this would be an example. And that's what he says in Exodus 20, 11. Later on in Exodus 30, he talks about the fact that it's a covenant. In six days, I created the heavens and the word, the seventh day I rested. And this will never change. This is a covenant between the Israelites forever that we will have six days and the seventh day is the Sabbath. It's the order of the week. Nobody has changed the week. God's command stays. Then I started to think about fossils, and you can't think, you can't help but think about death. Why? Because the fossils died. Most of them we find because of a catastrophe. We know that God came as a creator. We know that the earth got cursed, but Christ came back as a savior. And so he defeated death. We see death everywhere in the fossil record. But we have hope. Every time I pick a fossil, I know I have hope in Jesus because he defeated death. In 2 Timothy 1.10, it says, but it is now, it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We have immortality through Jesus Christ. He defeated death. We're not going to be some fossil laying on the, on the ground. God has created us so that we would be something special, that we would last for eternity in heaven. That's the message. And I pray, God, that as we look at this stuff, we see clearly that God's word is true. Our Savior is real. And he's, he's waiting for us in heaven uh, because that's where we belong. In Jesus' name, we say amen.